Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining. I think I've got that it is right on the bottom of the hour, so we'll get rolling. Um, so quick intro, you know, I know that this is competing with several sessions. We've got the keynote next door. We've got, I think there's a capture the flag game going on as well. So totally understood if y'all can't make it for the full two hours. So we're okay to go in and out. Um, little housekeeping here too is that we are having a door lock problem. So if you will, just be mindful of this door open over here and keep that um, open and feel free to move in and out. But I think the other doors are locked from the outside. Um, but with that being said, you know, thanks for coming. This is Cloud Approaches for Decision Makers. So we are gonna be, for the next two hours, kind of rolling through all kinds of cloud topics, such as basics, fundamentals, all of the you know, separate cloud providers and things that we can provide, um, and then also how that applies to the government and how we're currently being, seeing that being used in industry today. So, um, like I said, you know, this is probably, there, there are several competing sessions going on at the same time, but I would say that this is the absolute best session to be in if you're looking to take a nap because it's a full two hours. So you can have, you know, two hours of uninterrupted nap time as opposed to an hour and a half. But, quick intro, my name is Caroline Jones. I am a Azure Specialist for U.S. Army. I you know, work with the Army specifically, but also have experience in the DOD and intelligence industries, and I am huge on partner engagement. So I know that this is a you know, massive conference, a ton of different vendors here, and SaaS suppliers, uh, cloud hosting providers as well, and I am all about how we can collaborate to make this better for the United States government. Um, I also have a background in aerospace and events, and I'm just really passionate about why we're all here today. So thank you all for coming. I do, I say all this to say though, you know, I do work for Microsoft, and I do work with the US Army on Microsoft Azure, but I honestly want you to forget all of that, because today this is not a sales pitch, this is solely us talking about how we can best utilize the cloud and the partners and the other cloud vendors in the room as well, how we can go to market together and make sure that our customers are mission focused and using these tools best we can. So with that too, I do want to introduce um, Joel Day as well. Joel is right here in the front. He is a chief architect for um, our intelligence community at Microsoft specifically. But again, Joel is a wealth of knowledge in terms of any kind of technical questions and things like that that you may have. So um, with that too, you know, I'm here to, to have a good time for the next two hours and to make sure that this is a collaborative session and, and that you're getting things out of it. So I do not mind at all if you wanna raise your hand, please ask questions as we're going along or you know, we can have a little Q&A at the end as well and we're happy to chat there too. I know that y'all are taking very in-depth notes and will have plenty of questions for me. So quick agenda, we're gonna start off with Intelligent Cloud for national security. So kind of what this looks like in terms of best practices, current cloud environments, what we're seeing as industry trends today, um, and then, you know, of course, the basics. We are gonna run over a little bit of those infrastructure topics, PaaS, SaaS, IaaS, all that good stuff, networking, and then also we'll wrap up with varying stages of the cloud journey. So everything from procurement to governance, and then, of course, security as well. So we're gonna pretty much talk about everything in the next two hours, um, but we are, you know, happy to kick this off. So quick question, you know, I want us to be engaged here, so we're gonna do a little hand raising. Um, what is your biggest concern in moving to the cloud? Or if you are, you know, further down the road of moving to the cloud, or if you're a vendor or a partner, where do you see in the industry today the most issues here? So raise your hand if that would be security. Gotcha, checks out, I'm, I'm with you there. What about cost? Mm-hmm, time. Okay, yeah, we're all, we're all here on government time, so it's, uh, we're used to the time problem by now, I guess. Um, what about lack of technical resources? Absolutely, yeah. And then are there any others? Does anyone wanna share other concerns you may have? Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Other concerns, yes, what was that?
Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yes, sir. I, I totally understand. And thank you for sharing that too. That's like a combination of all the above, especially security, but also accessibility and zero trust essentially. So thank you for sharing that. We're going to talk about a lot of that today. Um, and I think we're all on the same page here with, with everything you said. Okay. So to start, we're going to do a little bit of, you know, fundamental level setting. I know we've got everything in the room from cloud experts to, you know, maybe some beginners in, in cloud migration strategies and things like that. So to level set a little bit, these are what I'm talking about when I say the cloud, right? So everything is the cloud. All of these four clouds that you see here essentially is how we categorize those based on the impact level of the data, of course. So on the left, you'll see, of course, the commercial cloud. So many, many cloud providers offer this commercial cloud. It is certified at aisle two in some cases, um, such as Google, AWS, Azure, the commercial cloud is certified at aisle two. Um, and you'll see customers in the commercial cloud like Delta Airlines or Starbucks or, can y'all tell? I, I, have been on a flight if Delta Airlines and Starbucks are my most two recent thoughts here. Um, Nike, Home Depot, Walmart, you name it. But those are who's going to sit in the commercial cloud. And then, you know, in a lot of cases with the government, even though, you know, you technically are, you know, government, so you'd think you need to sit in a government cloud in most cases, sometimes you also have IL2 data that is perfect to sit in an IL2 cloud as well. And we're going to talk about how we can, you know, jump across different enclaves. Moving over to the right one step, we have government clouds. So here over is really what we're going to be talking the most about today. So government clouds are certified, um, in Microsoft Azure's case, at aisle four and aisle five, and other cloud providers as well. You'll see a government cloud at aisle four and then a DOD cloud at aisle five, for example. That's where, of course, that data is going to sit. So that's for up from government to secret to top secret, those clouds are for US government customers only. So you'll see customers from the Army to uh, FHA, FDA, you know, any, anything that has that aisle four and five data, those are at those government clouds. Another interesting thing about these government secret and top secret clouds is that they are um, based just in CONUS. So that is, uh, you know, obviously for safety reasons, obviously for um, regulation reasons and things like that, but uh, we're going to talk about today how networking and secure networking allows you to access these clouds, although they are, you know, you may not have data that is all CONUS or even OCONUS. So, with that, one step over, we do have the secret clouds. So when I'm talking about secret clouds, that means IL-6. Um, and then top secret is for top secret classified data as well. So you'll see, you know, this kind of, these options for cloud computing. And, you know, they are all, when I say the different clouds, all of these are air gapped. So what that means is they are separate data centers, separate regions, all physically separated, secured, isolated, all of that so that we can make sure that we are best securing government data. So y'all may be familiar with this key security requirements summary. Um, this is straight from DISA's SRG for cloud computing. So you'll see kind of what I was just talking about earlier in the green, orange, and red, that the green, of course, is our uh, commercial clouds in a, a government um, speak. The orange is the Azure government clouds in four and five, and then in other providers, you'll see government at four and then DOD at five. And then top secret is that uh, secret cloud. So um, you'll note a few kind of interesting pieces here. One of these is location. So you'll see in all of these US or US outlying areas. Um, I want to point that out because a lot of times we'll get questions, for example, um, hey, my data is in Hawaii. You know, what do you mean your government data centers are only CONUS? You know, what do I do down here? Well, that can obviously travel through the networking and all of that that we have already set up with several different cloud providers and also networking providers as well, um, and that is still accessible uh, today. 
So then for connectivity as well, you'll see how the different connectivity levels kind of change. So of course, IL-2 or commercial is just over the internet. And then of course, you've got Nippernet via CAP connection points, and then uh, Cipernet as well. And then obviously on the separation too, you've got the different virtual logical um, separation requirements. So just kind of walking through this to show that this is how DISA has put this out and these are the requirements that you've got to follow and that we've got to follow. So Azure, AWS, Google, you know, IBM developing clouds as well, we've got, um, we're following these and we're building out based off of these requirements. So in terms of the compliance piece as well, you'll see that um, this is kind of a, a neat chart just because it shows you that, yes, we're constantly working on building out uh, compliance standards and making sure that we're meeting all of these compliance standards and more, um, but we also do things like work with Canada privacy laws, right, or Argentina's privacy laws and things like that. So we're constantly building out not just for government customers but in other um, aspects as well because, you know, in a lot of cases your data may be sitting in um, Canada, for example. Okay, so we talked about the different enclaves of clouds, so IL-2, 4, 5, 6, and then top secret as well. So if you were in the panel yesterday, we talked a little bit about how um, jumping from different, you know, it's important to, to have that data in the certified compliant cloud that it needs to sit in, but how can we make sure that we're collaborating securely across these clouds? Because in a lot of cases, you know, you're probably thinking, hey, my data, if it's sitting in a government cloud, it sometimes needs to collaborate with the data that's sitting in a secret cloud, right? Or vice versa. Um, so you're, you know, you're probably saying, not everything I have sits in IL-6, for example, as well. Or you, know, you may want to dev test sandbox um, in a lower enclave before you put it in a higher cloud. So the good news is, Today, we are consistently developing across all of the cloud providers and then also with several um, partners as well, the option for you know, build once, deploy anywhere, or build low, deploy high. And that is a huge, huge piece to this game that we're building out in the cloud world. You'll hear about CDS and you'll hear about you know, how can we have a sandbox environment in a lower cloud enclave too. So lots of um, kind of neat uh, industry revelations here because we're seeing that how, how can we work with the DOD, how can we work with the government to give the developers a secure environment to dev test, a um, you know, secure sandbox to get something production ready before sending it into prod. And then this is also true for example, when you have um, projects or POCs that you're working with in an unclass environment and then bringing them into a classified environment. So I'll pause there. Do we have questions on CDS or build low, deploy high, or kind of options on that, um, that hybrid cloud piece? Okay, sounds good. So also one thing to note here too is um, a piece of this that you may think about when you're thinking about collaborating and building low, deploying high is uh, VDI solutions or you know, how can I get my developers to bring their own device or have a secure VDI solution that you can work in IL-6 for example. And those are all pieces that you can take advantage of in the cloud today. Um, and you know, I totally understand your point earlier on how can we make sure that you this data is being secured, right? And how am I, you know, not just throwing my data over to Microsoft and you know losing it totally? And that's all uh, it's totally valid um, concerns that we are are working to address on a daily basis here. Um, and hopefully, we'll walk you through how we secure that. <coughs> Sorry. Oh yeah, hey. You're talking about the VDI solution right now, Yes, correct. Azure, ours is Azure Virtual Desktop. Mm -hmm. Ready to go. Is it in? Uh, we have customers using it today. Yep. Mm -hmm. I know, especially with it's almost like COVID has sped up that entire timeline because, you know, when we were here for last uh, TechNet Indo Pacific, it was in 2019, and um, back then we, you know, nobody had a, a, a VDI solution in IL-6. So it's pretty neat how, how industry trends have definitely sped up um, with a global pandemic. 
So categories of cloud computing. Quick intro here to kind of what we're talking about. We've got several categories, and this is not a list of um, cloud resources or anything like that, but these are kind of just the categories that we're talking about when we talk about different levels of, of cloud. So at the bottom, you'll see, this might be what you think about when you think about traditional cloud, and that is the infrastructure piece. So this is IaaS, or just your classic infrastructure as a service, classic architecture, networking, storage, security, things like that. One step up when we talk about serverless computing, that's kind of the PaaS category that we'll walk through a bit later too. And that includes everything from web apps to AI and ML to IoT containers, all of that good, really fun, sticky workloads. And then also edge devices. So this is a huge piece that is really coming into play, um, specifically at this conference too. I'm loving all of the vendors and um, cloud providers focus on edge devices because cloud no longer is just um, racks of servers that you're borrowing from, from cloud providers, right? We're working on continually having the ability to access and use that data at remote and edge locations. So this is kind of um, a quick overall view of what we're talking about when we talk about dev test and prod or how we are building out architecture and how we should structure that for our data to be most useful in these cloud provider models. So in the middle, you'll see kind of where you have your different apps or um, the layers of monitoring, dev test and prod, security, containers, things like that, um, or even software factories too. I know that a lot of you are likely working in software factory um, environments today, and that is also something that is extremely and increasingly important in the government clouds today. But then you'll see how that all integrates with native architecture. It can integrate with your on-prem architecture as well. And then you can also utilize the open source or third-party environments too. So all of these kind of native services on the left, whether that may be in AWS or in Azure or in Google Cloud, for example, those are integrated with your exact applications. And then you can take advantage of you know, using the tools that you like to use and that your developers like to use. Um, existing. Okay, so quick pause there. We are going to dive into a little bit of cloud basics. Um, you know, this is, again, level setting, so I know a lot of you probably already know this too, but we're just going to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of cloud definitions and why these things are important. Okay, so a couple key concepts and terms that we keep at the forefront of our attention when we're talking about developing in the cloud and building a cloud environment. One of those is gonna be the whole category of agility, right? So how do we make sure that our data is agile, that we've got agile cloud environments to work and develop and build in? So scalability to start off with. Scalability handles the scaling of resources, of course, scalability, scaling, um, according to the system's workload demands. So there are kind of two main categories of scalability. One of those will be scale up, which means handling and increasing workload by adding resources to that existing infrastructure. Um, and that's kind of a short-term solution to meet those immediate needs. And then you've got scale out as the other piece of scalability. Scaling out being expanding that existing infrastructure with new elements to tackle those more significant and sticky workload environments and requirements. So the scale out piece is kind of a more long-term solution aimed to cover future resource demands as well as the present ones. So a couple of examples of scalability. Um, one of those would be chatbots, right? So we get a lot of customers today working with um, needing chatbot solutions. I know that the VA, for example, um, they have a massive chatbot solution that they've built out that several of you probably have interacted with before. Um, so chatbots, you know, in terms of scalability, as the bot is used more, as you use a chatbot and you're utilizing the AI and ML models there, as you use that more, as it's getting, gaining more data and, and learning, essentially, scalability allows for that model to expand rapidly and become smarter. So in the past, um, or you know, in an on-prem environment, scalability depended on what kind of hardware you had and what you could uh, you know, have in terms of resource allocation. So in terms of moving to a cloud model, you have 
tons more options and you can take advantage of those economies of scale for cloud providers so that you can have those resources available without actually having the physical resources ready to provision. And then elasticity kind of goes hand in hand with scalability and that elasticity is just the system's ability to manage the resources that you have available according to your dynamic workload environments. So this, a good example of kind of allotting to spikes in resource requirements would be something like um, Black Friday for our commercial customers. So on Black Friday, you probably, ha or Cyber Monday, um, either one these days, you probably have an extreme spike in uh, website hits and you have an extreme spike in the need for exist increasing infrastructure so that you don't have you know your site go down or something like that so that's a, a good example of elasticity there and then of course global reach uh, we talked a little bit about that earlier but we always especially in a DOD and intelligence case we've got to make sure we have that global reach but also that spatial reach too so we'll talk a little bit more about um, our space offerings in the cloud, both with AWS and Azure and Google, and then also how we can take advantage of existing infrastructure across the globe and beyond as well. Okay, cost too, you know, we wanna make sure we're talking about predictive planning and economies of scale. We'll dive into predictive planning in terms of how do you make sure that we are not just tossing money into the cloud and not gonna know where it goes or how much you're gonna spend, but how do we take advantage of existing both native cloud tools to show you your spending and help you manage your spending, but also there are a ton of awesome SaaS solutions that you can use in the cloud as well for cost monitoring and management. Availability. So the two big pieces here are fault tolerance and disaster recovery. Fault tolerance, of course, is um, guaranteeing kind of zero downtime. So how do we make sure that in the case of a fault of, a fault of some sort, we can build out the infrastructure according to that and that we don't have any downtime in these major production applications, for example. Disaster recovery is kind of a step above that fault tolerance and that DR is a complete plan to recover those critical business systems and normal operations. So, you know, God forbid there's something like a hurricane that takes out an entire region or a um, cyber attack, for example, or something else that would take out an entire region of data centers. How do we make sure that we've got those region pairs so that your data and your production applications are totally um, recoverable and ready to go in a separate region? And then we'll dive into security a bit later. So everything around intelligence, threat detection, but also reporting. I know that monitoring and analytics and reporting are massive and increasingly important when it comes to both making sure that our government data is useful, but also managing your cloud environment and managing everything that you have in, in a um, cloud and on-prem capacity. Okay, so real quick to um, economies of scale. So, you know, a big piece and a major selling point, if you will, on moving to a public cloud model and moving to a public cloud provider are these economies of scale. So, you know, for example, Microsoft, AWS, Google, they are spending trillions of dollars with a T or on specifically for government clouds, spending billions of dollars with a B only on building out government clouds so that you can take advantage of those resources that are available there. So, you know, if each organization, each army command, each, um, you know, intelligence community agency, each space force, right, if they were to go alone and build out their own clouds and build out their own infrastructure, that would take incredible amounts of time, money, and resources to do what AWS, Azure, and Google are doing today in the government space. So could not encourage you more to take advantage of the existing and increasing infrastructure, security, analytics, and intelligence that's being built out today. So that's kind of the overall cloud pitch. I'm sure you've heard that before. We could talk and go on and on about OPEX, CAPEX, and why this is important to take advantage of, but um, you know, wanted to, of course, hit on that. Okay, so quick definition on public cloud models. I, uh, you know, sometimes customers will be like, public cloud? 
I have data in IL-6, and there's no way I'm going to a public cloud model. Well, you know, we mean public cloud by the term of commercial cloud providers uh, utilizing, or the government utilizing commercial cloud providers' investments. So a couple of benefits to using public cloud models, such as Microsoft, Azure, Google, GCP, and AWS, one of those being multiple end users. That's just a, a definition of a public cloud model is that there are several end users. So in a government model, you'll have you know, the Army, and then you'll also have um, the FDA, for example. Or in a commercial environment, you'll have Nike and you'll have um, Hershey's Chocolate. So lots of end users and public cloud models, and then also you have that availability. So these are the most um, kind of best way to have that scalability and elasticity that we talked about earlier, and then also take advantage of massive, massive investments in uh, fault tolerance and disaster recovery too. And then skills, one to point out on number four here is that um, kind of a big piece of public cloud models is that they don't, believe it or not, require deep technical knowledge to set up and use. So not only are they simpler than setting up, for example, your own um, racks and managing those and, and having to have the technical skills there, but also all of these cloud providers that I'm talking about today, and you have a lot of system integrators that can help with this as well, they are absolutely, we have a ton of resources, a ton of humans who are ready and able to have hands-on keywords help to help you deploy to these public cloud models. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about public cloud. Um, and then private cloud is really just essentially having your rack of servers in the, the closet down the hall. So private cloud is totally where you're responsible for hardware, you're responsible for the security and the provisioning of that hardware, and then you also have um, your users are used exclusively by that organization. So uh, the mix of these two is hybrid cloud. So we'll talk a lot about this today, especially because anybody who says that um, you know, DOD needs to go entirely to a public cloud model, I think that we are missing a piece there because there are a lot of cases that, uh, you know, require on-prem still and require the need to have uh, secure on-prem um, models in your existing command, right? So hybrid cloud means that you are kind of a combination of either one cloud provider and your on-prem environment, or also, in today's world, you are using several different clouds today. So yesterday in the panel session, I don't know if you guys um, caught this part, I loved this part though, it was basically how um, Angel Smith, she said, you know, when, if, if I were to stand up here and say that you should just go totally to Azure, I would be not looking out for your best interests of, of the DOD customer because in you know, today's world and we are all different, I was actually just talking with um, my Google friend in that we, it's best for us to work together at what we are, we're best at and to you know, have the customer utilize different cloud providers for what their strengths are, right? So there's not one size fits all, I don't care who says what, but there is not a one size fits all in terms of, of cloud providers. So, kind of with the, re the um, retirement, I guess we'll call it, of the JEDI contract, for example, I think that it is um, increasingly wise for us to move towards a model where you can select from multiple cloud providers, so. Okay, quick level set on on-prem versus IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS. So on-prem, right, and the big piece here that I want to point out is what you're managing. So on-prem means that you as the customer, you as the commander agency, are managing, securing, making sure that you are updating and provisioning everything from networking all the way to the applications and the users. So really all of this is your responsibility to secure as well. Um, one step over is kind of this is where we enter the cloud environment. So IaaS, or infrastructure as a service, is where the vendor, you give the vendor, meaning 
Azure, AWS, Google, whoever, the responsibility to manage and secure your networking, server, storage, virtualization, but you manage everything from the operating system all the way up the stack to the applications. So what this means is this is a good scenario for when you, know, you just essentially want to do a lift and shift and migrate your resources into um, the cloud model, but you still want a lot of control over your operating system and your applications. One step over is platform as a service or PaaS. This is my particular favorite category, um, if you're asking, but <laughs> the vendor managed piece is everything from networking to servers to storage to operating system and runtime and middleware. So that leaves you as the customer just managing applications and data. So the PaaS model is a really good use case for when you want to focus on application development or when you, know, you would like to kind of have a hands-off approach to monitoring your operating system and securing all of that and just focusing on that application layer. And then a further step is SaaS or software as a service. Software as a service is essentially just that. It's, it's software and you don't have to manage anything except essentially the users and authentication of that. So everything from the actual application all the way down to the networking is managed by that cloud provider or that partner solution. So when we're talking about SaaS, we think about things like um, you know, Red Hat, uh, any kind of partner, Cloudera, um, Hypori, things like that. That's, those are all SaaS solutions and um, great to take advantage of as well. So all of these can work together, right? You don't have to pick one. That's sometimes a question that we get a lot. It's like, well, how I, I need SaaS solutions and IS solutions. What do I do? Um, these all play nicely together and uh, that's what we're here for is to help you all kind of maintain and build out these, these environments. So with that being said, you know, it's a shared responsibility. We talked a little bit earlier about how can I trust that my data is secure and how do I trust that um, Microsoft, for example, is using my data in a secure way. Um, but you know, all this being said, your pick of on-prem, IS, PaaS, and SaaS, it is a partnership. So we want you to make sure we want to make sure that you know that your data is never Microsoft's, for example. Your data does not belong to AWS. It's still United States Navy data, for example, or it's still, you know, your data and your responsibility to make sure that you are securing that appropriately. Now, that being said, we are consistently and increasingly invested in 100% maintaining the security of your data. So we're here to, here to absolutely help and, and help you utilize um, security features in the cloud, but it's still a shared responsibility, of course. This is one of my favorite pieces here. So, um, you know, this is kind of a picture of some of the government partners today that have SaaS solutions that are available in the aisle four, five, six, top secret, some of them clouds. So, you know, getting started with using the cloud, we understand can definitely be a challenge, but that's where we want to make sure that you're able to bring the resources that you like, the tools that you like to use, and the existing um, software solutions that you may already be using today. So kind of looking at these solutions here, you may recognize, of course, Splunk, Riverbed, um, SQL Server, Citrix, you know, you name it, walk the halls in the exhibit hall and you'll be able to see any one of these um, particular SaaS providers. But we play extremely nicely with them. So it's not like we're gonna walk up and say to you, hey, you should put all of your everything and only use AWS solutions or you should only use Azure native solutions. We will never say that because that is not at the best interest to the customer. So we wanna make sure that you can use what you like to use right now and bring that to the cloud. Um, so we also you know, have things like the Azure Government Marketplace, which is essentially like an app store kind of, um, where you can go in and essentially click and deploy these um, solutions into your cloud natively. And so then you can take advantage of a single pane of glass to manage and secure and monitor these SaaS solutions as well as what you have in Azure, for example, existing. So lots of good solutions here. Um, you know, one thing with that is, of course, it's not free. Uh, you'll still have to pay for the licenses in a lot of cases on this side. So you may need to bring your 
um, Cisco licenses with you or your Esri licenses with you, for example. But really good way to make sure that you are operating in a secure environment and you're still able to manage those. Kind of the back end architecture of how that marketplace works is it essentially just um, deploys that solution on a secured Azure government VM, for example, and that way you can make sure that not only is the SaaS application secured, but also you're running it on a secure VM. So um, you could obviously do that uh, yourself too and build out that architecture in, in several different clouds, but that's kind of how that works on the back end. Joel, do you know the answer to that? Um, so, the marketplaces for secrets and top secrets or the different database environments are evolving. So, there are uh, the IaaS component where software is available on the top of it and they've got some of their software appliances. They're still running on the IaaS element. Whereas, like the platform and the SaaS, um, those weren't really available under this like CQS contract. Did not So let's talk real quick about the migration journey, which is essentially a buzzword that we're hearing a lot of today, right, with migration and how we can um, digitally transform your environment. Lots of good buzzwords that we love to use. But what we're talking about when we say migration journey to the cloud and how do you get to the cloud, starting with on-prem on the left, um, there's kind of a series of migrate, modernize, and then the option for SaaS solutions as well. So the four R's here are the rehost, refactor, rearchitect, and rebuild. Um, and what we're talking about when we mean all of those above is how do we make sure we are um, securely lifting and shifting if you'd like to just move your on-prem to an IaaS environment? Or how do we make sure we're refactoring and rearchitecting in terms of a containers managed platform, which is a excellent use case. And then on the PaaS and serverless environment too, how are we re-architecting and rebuilding those existing applications that you may have in an on-prem IaaS environment, or sorry, on-prem environment, and rebuilding those to best fit in your cloud environment. So all of that may sound scary, but we've got teams, again, at each of the major cloud providers, and then also a lot of SIs, and partner solutions that are here to help and have experts and technical hands-on keyboards resources or also over-the-shoulder resources or consulting resources to help you build out and to have this, this process. So you'll see a lot of cost savings and time savings and resource savings if you can take advantage of, of these, these offerings. So, um, you know, two main points here is that you will have to have things like foundational investments. So technical investments, people investments, and processes investments will have to go into your migration journey. But that is just part of the process, and that's something that will um, pay off in the long run, of course, but also help the process move smoothly as you um, you know, go through this migration process. And then of course, you gotta have the top-down buy-in as well. So a lot of you here are those top-down decision makers, right? So you've got the executive sponsorship, you've got the business use case, um, and you're, you're likely ready to, you know, begin this cloud migration journey. Um, but, you know, one piece here too is we're big on business case. So anytime you hear 
hey, we're moving to the cloud, or hi, um, I'm a customer and I need to move to the cloud, we say, hey, look, let's sit down and let's look at the business case. Are we looking at a specific program, a specific application that we want to move? You know, how do we kind of break this down into a business and mission focused goal and then migrate, refactor, rehost, rearchitect, and rebuild to then um, better serve the end user and the warfighter? So that's kind of what uh, the process here looks like. It's a continuous process as well, so we know that it's not a single step of, okay, I'm gonna begin assessing in November, and then um, by December I'm gonna migrate, and January I'm gonna optimize. I wish, and it's also not all at the same time, typically. So you may have different uh, programs or commands who go in waves or different applications who, who need to be one is in the assess stage and then another application is already being optimized and ready to go. So it, it varies and it's not a one size fits all, but there are a lot of migration services that you can take advantage of to help with that. Okay, so a couple core cloud services here, um, regions. I know I've talked about regions a little bit already, but what regions are, um, are essentially collections of data centers. So when you hear about an Azure government region or an AWS government region or GCP government region, you'll hear, um, you know, it's not just one data center. So it's not one specific spot that can essentially be taken out with a targeting effort. It's a collection of data centers that are separated over 500 miles apart in, in Azure's case. Um, so that's just an important note that when you hear, for example, U.S. government Virginia region, that's an, an Azure region, um, that means it is a collection of data centers. So you can kind of imagine with these, these massive regions, we've got over 65 regions across the globe. Um, that means we have many, many more than 65 data centers across the globe. So to kind of play up to the scale of this, right, a region, again, is a collection of data centers, and I say all this to, to remind you of the economies of scale benefit that we talked about earlier, but this is a picture of that U.S. government data center um, that I mentioned earlier. So if you'll see just the massive scale of this compared to, like, a car down here in the parking lot, just imagine the size of a server or a rack compared to in one of these massive buildings. Um, one of these buildings also can hold two Boeing 747 planes in there. So these are just absolutely massive. This is entirely Microsoft owned and entirely just Microsoft government data certified at aisle four and five. So this just the, the picture of this one data center and we have many, many more and many more regions than just this one data center, of course, um, kind of shows you how we are investing and building out these regions. Um, but with that being said, here is the same data center. You'll see this is now here in the bottom, and that's just the massive build out that this was just from 2020. So this is a bit more finished today, but um, I didn't have time to take out my um, drone or helicopter to go take an aerial photo of the data center today. Um, but this just is, is to show you just the massive scale. It's honestly crazy to think about the investments that Microsoft, Amazon, and Google are putting into building out these clouds for you sitting here today. So crazy stuff. How many regions do you guys have uh, classified? So we have, Joel, correct me if I'm wrong, seven cla or five classified government regions, two classified secret regions, to classified top secret regions. Well, I think that depends on how you architecture it, right? Um, yeah, go ahead. I tell you I have to kill you. <laughs> um, 
But yes, and then the other thing too that I love about the data center separation for our classified clouds is that, uh, I said earlier, you have to have over 500 miles of separation. So even if a hurricane or um, a some sort of uh, nuclear weapon were to take out the entire East Coast, um, we'd all be safe here in Hawaii and we'd also still have our classified data in another region um, separate from that. So pretty cool stuff. Um, Let's see, so here's a quick uh, overall picture of the specifically Microsoft Azure global footprint. Now I say this because I easily have access to this. I'm sure that my peers in Google and AWS also have similar um, maps to this that, that they're happy to show you, but this is just Azure specifically. So this kind of shows you the massive scale of when we're talking about regions and networking. So one thing I wanna point out here is our 130,000 miles of fiber and subsea cable. So this is, Microsoft specifically has one of the largest um, fiber networks actually in the world. If we were a telco provider, we would be the number two largest um, behind our friends at AT&T. So that is a pretty cool investment that we make available to you. What this means is that with that fiber build out and with that cable build out, these are private Microsoft Azure fiber. So that means that you can take advantage of using the Azure private networking and not have to share this physical fiber with, um, you know, just whoever is able to rent that. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. It is, uh, yeah, that is crazy. Also, I'm so, I apologize for this. We were talking about it earlier. Um, black slides always look so cool, but then you come to a presentation like this and it's like, come on, could they not be white? Um, but yeah, so we've got, this is kind of a rough overview of where these are located. I, there aren't. Um, oh yeah, sorry, this is North America. So yeah, North America, South America, Africa, so and so. Um, you can see big investments over in Europe, of course, uh, with our friends over there. Um, also, a lot of uh, Indo-Pacific action as well, India, South Africa, Australia. Um, so, it would be fun to go on a tour of all the data centers, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So we, in terms of government, so aisle four and above, no. This is a map, sorry, forgive me if I did not clarify that. This is Microsoft Azure total, so com including commercial as well. So if you're a commercial um, customer or if you're a DOD customer who has aisle two data in South Korea, for example, you're welcome to use one of our South Korea data centers. Um, but that kind of goes hand in hand with why we have built out this massive fiber network that I'm talking about is because we understand that, especially with y'all, you know, when you've got data in Africa, for example, um, you need to be able to ac access your government data centers um, in, in the continental US. Um, so there are you know, many ways to utilize that and get back to that data and uh, utilize Microsoft Azure computing outside of the US. And it's, it's done every day. So there are no data centers existing in Hawaii um, today for Microsoft Azure government, but we have obviously many customers in Hawaii using Microsoft Azure government secret and top secret. Um, the DISA-B cap, if you're familiar with cap uh, cloud access points, um, we have those that you can access in California and that's typically the closest uh, cap connection point um, that you can get to, but it's, it's easily accessible from Hawaii networks. One thing too is, uh, oh here's a slide that you may like. So here's what the Azure government piece looks like. Um, you'll see that we have a lot of action in the uh, Virginia and DC area, but also Phoenix, Texas, and then the CAP and Express Route points. So real quick in terms of networking, um, something, you know, I showed you the, the networking infrastructure that we have here, and that is Microsoft 
just Microsoft specific networking. However, you can go a step further and you can have specific dedicated to your command um, networking that's totally private. That's called an express route. And what that means, and a lot of our Hawaii customers are using express routes today. And what that means is you have a totally dedicated fiber to the uh, CAP connection point, essentially, to then access the Azure government um, data that you have. And then you can actually go a step further, which this is pretty wild, and have an express route direct, which is uh, literally we lay the wire for you. So, awesome, thanks for questions. So you'll see it to the um, physical separation that we're seeing here. Okay, so touching a little bit on availability zones as we were asking, as we were talking about earlier, um, these are separate locations within a region. So when you, you know, have requirements that you need independent um, or data to be available, and then we separate that over independent power, cooling, and networking. So for example, if somebody um, pulls the plug on a server, then your data, if, you're, if you've set up an availability zone, um, then you can still access that data and have that working. So this is a really good kind of best practice in terms of cloud architecture. Um, the other thing too is, and we'll talk a little bit later about um, this, this is secure cloud computing architecture that, that is um, required now, and it's an awesome architecture, but these are built into that. So. There are a lot of steps to take in Azure government and in Azure government clouds to make sure that you're building out architectures like this and having that data constantly available. Um, and we are here to help you build those out. Similar to availability zones are availability sets. Um, and these are built up of update and fault domains, which are kind of neat. Um, I know we're getting kind of technical into how we are failing over on the actual physical hardware in those government data centers. Um, but the cool thing about update domains in, is that they essentially, this is for maintenance. So if you wanna, you know, one run update, run one update on a specific server or rack, then you can run that, but also make sure that you still have the others ready to go so you're not updating something that may, um, you know, have a little bit of downtime while you're updating on a specific server or rack. Um, and then fault domains, similar, is that provides physical separation of your workload across different hardware within the data center. So again, kind of on a pull the plug scenario, a fault domain would make sure that if um, in the off chance that power would be lost or something overheats, your data is still available on another rack in the data center. So that's different from an availability zone when you've got the failover from different data centers. Sorry, just saw your hand. Sorry, just to mm -hmm. back a little bit, the express route time that you mentioned, yeah. also Yes, so that is available overseas and um, we encourage you to actually use that um, as part of the secure cloud computing architecture if you're using government secret or top secret regions. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's keep rolling. I'm gonna keep us moving. All right, so when we talk about you know managing the cloud, uh, you may be familiar with the cloud portals. So we've got the Azure portal that you access everything on. The AWS has a portal as well as far, and so does Google. Um, and this is kind of where you manage and access everything. Um, for Azure government, for example, it's azure.gov, azure. It's your domain .azure .us, sorry. And um, it's uh, essentially this is where you see everything. You manage your costs, you manage your security, you're able to build, develop, manage your users and their access rights, um, but that's, that's what we're talking about there. In terms of infrastructure options too, um, I know that we, we all talk a lot about VMs and IaaS and um, things like that, but we never really talk about what's actually available. There are a ton of options. There are hundreds of options of infrastructure choices that are designed to run every type of workload. So if you've got you know, general purpose workloads such as SQL Server, Windows Server, Linux, things like that, or if you've got specialized workloads such as our friends at VMware, SAP, NetApp, things like that, then you can also have specific infrastructure built out for that too. So this being said, you know, we, we like to touch on this because it's not a one size fits all piece, right? We used to kind of operate that in, in that way when we were 
first building out cloud models is that, you know, a VM is a VM and let's all go use the same VMs. But, um, you know, there are quantum VMs. We've got HPC VMs that are being used by a lot of our DoD customers today. Um, so that being said, infrastructure is available for whatever workload you may need. One fun fact too is we get this question a lot. It's like, hey, can I run my um, Linux in an Azure VM? Like that sounds awful. I guess I'm gonna not be able to do that. And it's it's a fun fact that um, we actually, Microsoft VMs, last I heard, Microsoft actually runs more Linux VMs than Windows VMs. So again, just on the piece of bring what you like, we wanna make sure that it works for you and you can utilize that in the best way possible. A good analogy that, that we like to use is that Azure is the um, essentially electric provider, and so bring whatever refrigerator you want, bring whatever hair dryer or iron or um, TV that you'd like, but we just want to supply the electricity and make sure everything's running securely and happily. And then same with compute. Um, kind of when we're looking at compute options from VMs to containerized applications, you've got a ton of options. And again, we're here to help on what fits best for each workload. But the, the important question to ask when you're looking at compute options is how much control do I need over my application? Because again, control comes with that responsibility of security and cost management and things like that provisioning, um, but sometimes you do need more control in a VM or VM scale set capacity, um, or Azure or AWS container services, things like that. And then you can move up and have code only applications and compute services as well. Okay, let's dive into some networking. Gotcha, so this is kind of what, this is government specific here. So with the Azure government classified regions, Customers can connect natively to classified networks, or you can connect and leverage options for private, resilient, high bandwidth connectivity as well. So kind of as the first piece here, you've got the option for direct connections. So if you have a agency or a command with a direct native connection, through existing US government classified networks, then you can connect natively to Azure government secret or top secret or Azure government. So that's one option. One step down, we have express route. So you can extend with express route, extend your on-prem network into Azure government secret or top secret regions over a private connection facilitated by a connectivity provider with Express Route. So that's a really common option that we're seeing today. Um, CONUS, OCONUS, you know, with a lot of this classified data, and uh, that's one option you have there too. And then Express Route Direct, I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, you can connect directly into government secret and top secret using that private dedicated um, physical fiber that we actually lay for you. So lots of cool use cases. All of these are being used today. It's not, again, a one size fits all. So we work with customers um, across the board in the intelligence and DoD space to kind of pick and select which connectivity option works best for you. Hey, yeah. What would you say, Joel? So Express Route, regular Express Route is a uh, classified network used for magic uh, that you provision with a few channels. Right? Uh, Express Route Direct, it, and that's why Express Route, when you set up Express Route, you, you do that before. Right? And you do that with your ISP. So Express Route Direct, uh, when you establish that, establish that connection, that's when you communicate with the entire system. You know, and we actually 
<laughs> so, um, so yeah, that's kind of what we're hoping to leverage in that new feature as well. That that is that is uh, we have to work on that, but that is uh, a scenario that a lot of people have asked about, and uh, that is the the objective of what we're trying to do with the program. So uh, it, that would be more an infrastructure event where you would have your uh, you would have your satellite uplink, mm -hmm. and then that private connection from wherever the satellite. Great question, though. That's exactly the use cases that this is built out for. Yep. Interesting. I, I honestly would love to know um, because I'm pretty sure there's also a cap connection in Seattle as well. Um, but I'm not sure what that would look like. It may be the need for a direct express route direct. Um, and I guess the, the cost savings of just moving the entire enterprise. Um, yeah, not sure, but interesting use case. Okay. Interesting. Joel, do you? Yeah, I mean, Express Route Direct, uh, you need to be, there, it's, it's actual fiber, like there's private fiber that is connected to you to wherever uh, our connection or Microsoft's connection. So uh, that may have been a decision, part of the decision. Um, this is all related to the same part of the same local Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, it, that may be a decision. I know that there are folks that are, that are running the private side, but yeah, to get private side,
It may be just because of the tax benefits in California. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> but, um, I mean, I live in, in D.C. with probably 87% of you here, so I'm glad we could all get together in, in Hawaii. Um, but with that, I do want to point out one thing. Um, you know, a lot of the concern, and that is a concern with cloud networking today, is, you know, how do I, hey, I'm in um, Mississippi, for example, and I'm utilizing the Azure Gov Arizona data center, you know, am I, you're, am I gonna have downtime or networking problems? And the answer is no, you're still gonna experience because of our networking and existing infrastructure that we built out and the cap points that you have access to, um, you know, you're still gonna experience that sub millisecond latency in, in many cases and you won't notice a difference. So pretty neat the, the infrastructure that's being built out and, and spent um, today. And then on, yeah. That is a good question. Joel, do you know the answer to that one? Yeah, are you familiar with NREST? So uh, when you get back on the JWIT site, you can look up NREST, N-R-E-S-T. They're the organization that's, that's uh, providing that, that connectivity solution for all of our data sites. Would it be enough to pay both sides for connectivity, or do they just repay you at the same time? Or so,
Yep. So that's a good question. You know, to be clear, when we're talking about government secret and top secret regions, so aisle four, five, six, and top secret data, um, the two, just to, to state the facts here, the two cloud providers with all the way up to aisle six and top secret are AWS and Azure. And that means that, you know, today we are fully in production running workloads um, all the way up the stack there. <clears throat> Google has, um, you know, they're, they're, they're coming up um, pretty quick too, which is great, but they currently have a provisional authorization at aisle four. So kind of a, a mixture in terms of what you can um, select from, which is why, you know, we love a multi-cloud model and we think that there are many, many benefits um, to using different cloud providers for, for different resources, which is why I love the question too on how can we, um, you know, can we have AWS and Azure talk in JWAX, for example. Um, but yeah, that's what we're moving towards. And with this existing government build out, we're excited to see, you know, who else can get these accreditations so that we can um, experience the beauty of capitalism. <laughs> So with that too, um, Express Route Partners, right? We mentioned who we partner with and who you could use to access these Express Routes, build out these Express Routes, and then also um, connect with. So again, wanna just foot stomp that. We are big on partnerships. Um, and then, you know, this wouldn't be a conference if we weren't talking about zero trust. Zero trust is absolutely at the foundation of what all of us should be architecting today in the cloud. And um, you know, this is essentially what we're focused on in terms of securing y'all's networks. Um, one of those is that we wanna be ready to handle attacks before they happen. Two is that we want to minimize the extent of the damage and how fast it spreads. And then three, we want to increase this difficulty of compromising your cloud footprint. So, you know, with that comes, you know, we want to make it as hard as possible for an adversary to be able to access your networks and your data. And in a lot of cases, um, that's best utilized over multiple cloud scenarios, over multiple um, SaaS providers as well. Okay, so on the topic of Azure Orbital um, and Ground Station as a service, these are the, the AWS uh, service is Ground Station as a service and the Azure service is Azure Orbital. So essentially what Azure Orbital is, and um, again, this is in production being used today by intelligence and DOD customers, um, but this allows you to essentially you know, let's take this data and these networking capabilities to the extreme tactical edge, right? So we are essentially allowing you to downlink data from space, um, on ramping your satellite data directly into AWS and Azure. And sorry, not your satellite data, but data that travels over our satellite investments. So essentially we've partnered with SATCOM providers, Starlink, people like that to build out this satellite connectivity and build out this infrastructure so that you don't have to send your own satellites into space and utilize networking and data processing there. So this is huge. You know, it's taking the, um, the war fighting zones past land, air, sea, and cyberspace and adding space there as well, which is awesome. Um, but also it's like, you know, how about we utilize this in a um, commercial capacity and take advantage of what Azure and AWS have already invested in, um, in this capacity. So for network connectivity there, this module makes sure that you've got resiliency through multiple satellite connections and partners in different orbits too. So it's actually really cool how this works 
in a technical standpoint. Um, it's, it's pretty cool to talk about, you know, we're always like, oh, at different data centers and physically separated, yada, yada, yada. But it's really interesting to take it a step further and say we've got multiple different orbits that we're, we're um, sending stuff through it to. So pretty cool feature there. All right, we're gonna keep rolling a little bit. I actually am gonna skip storage today. I know that that is an exciting um, topic, but we are gonna roll past that. And if you have storage questions, you can find us at booth 816, I think. Um, so, okay, talking about big data and analytics. Um, we know that in a lot of cases, you're like, hey, my storage won't fit on your attached disk to a VM. And we totally understand that. But also, in today's hyperscale cloud environment, we want to make sure that you are not having to store all of that data over and over and over again, or having to store data that may not be useful to you. Um, so, you know, how do we, it's, it's like in 2022 today, we're no longer coming across the problem of needing to collect more data. We're coming across the problem of, of course, making that data useful and making sure that we are using those analytics. I, there's several, you know, keynotes and everybody's talking about um, data processing and um, using that for defense. But in Azure today, you've got these options to be able to expand limitlessly and going far beyond um, essentially that hyperscale and modern app development too. Cool, questions here? We're rolling through the storage. Lots of storage partners as well, too. You'll see, I'm sure you're working with many of these partners today in an on-prem or a hyperscale cloud scenario as well, but NetApp, Riverbed, Cohesity, you know, we love to play nice with everybody that you'll see here, too, in a storage capacity. All right, so moving on to hybrid a little bit. We are, today we're looking at how we're evolving past that on-prem scenario, right? But again, we have a lot of use cases like we talked about earlier on, you have those on-prem workloads that you're, are gonna need to remain on-prem. But how do we take it past just a single cloud provider? How do we move into separate cloud scenarios? And also, how do we bring that to the edge as well and make sure that we are taking advantage of applications across those environments? So a couple of questions here, or really concerns for IT departments that we're running against today is, how are we gonna govern these, right? So how are we gonna make sure the right people have the right access to the right applications and data when they need that? And then how do we make sure that we can bring that cloud innovation to your existing infrastructure? So when we're talking about hybrid today, you know, you've got, sorry, moved fast. You've got everything from your applications to your containers, VMs, wherever those applications are running, to the multi-cloud environment, right? So everything from, like we talked about with Azure and AWS environments, um, in up the stack and top secret environments too, and how do we make sure that we can evolve the architecture that we're working with y'all to build out, and then also at the same time secure those. So to kind of talk about how we can do this in a DOD capacity, right? We need these hybrid cloud environments to be managed from a central location. Or it's honestly the easiest if we can manage these from a central location. So when you're hosting data in these government certified clouds, cloud providers can make sure that you can inventory, organize, and then govern these IT resources from that central place. So whether you're managing that from the Azure Gov environment, how can you make sure that you're not only securing your on-prem and your edge investments too, um, but also how can you make sure to secure your hybrid cloud, AWS, and Google investments as well. So with that, um, kind of taking it to the edge, let's talk a little bit about um, edge devices, right? So we, you'll see a lot of, out in the, the vendor section, you'll see a lot of different edge devices. You'll talk to Dell and see a lot of great offerings there. HPE, Amazon's got some. Azure, of course, has some as well. Um, but how do we essentially use these edge devices to both secure your data and give you access to your cloud resources, but also modernize the mission wherever you may need access to that? So the really cool thing about edge devices is that, kind of like we talked about storage a little bit earlier, is that instead of having to either store all of this data that you may be collecting at the edge or process that, send that over the bandwidth back to wherever you may be processing that, not at the edge, 
um, you know, edge devices allow you to process, make that data useful wherever you need that data. So this is a huge piece, especially in government and DOD and intelligence customers today. How can we enable the warfighter at the edge in a disconnected or intermittent scenario and make sure that we're utilizing cloud processes right there where you are? So, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple options here. You know, you may be familiar with the Azure Stack portfolio that essentially gives you that scalable virtualization, storage, things like that. Um, Stack Edge as well takes that MI, MLAI scenarios past your data processing and takes it to the edge. And then AWS also has their Snowball and Outpost offerings too. So essentially, you know, you've got your choice in terms of edge devices and edge processing, but this is just huge use cases. Um, so, you know, we talk a lot about with edge devices, about using that in a disconnected or intermittent scenario, but in a lot of cases, especially with a lot of the customers we've got in the room today, you may have um, an on-prem scenario where you need an Azure Stack, for example, in your own data center, and that's totally another use case. You know, you don't have to be processing um, somewhere in Afghanistan to need a use case for an Azure Stack, for example, um, but you've got the capability to also bring the power of Azure, the power of Hyperscale Cloud to your existing data center. And then one specific piece too, specifically for um, the government customers, so DOD and IC that Azure specifically has built out is our ruggedized portfolio. So this is very interesting because these are native Microsoft Azure devices that you actually order through the Azure portal and they send to you and you know we've got to do the whole shipping thing and all that. But these are ruggedized and specifically built and only available to government customers. So on the left, you'll see the MDC, and this is a pretty cool um, rugged device, essentially. It's a shipping container-sized um, cloud environment, essentially. You can actually have four different enclaves of um, classification in these MDCs. And I'm sure you're probably thinking about different use cases for this. So whether you're disconnected and would need this kind of data center sized um, private cloud capability, then that's a great use case for that. But I know our customers in the Navy today are using this um, as a uh, ship scenario too. So you've got other options too that are a lot smaller and more convenient than a shipping container sized data center, um, and Azure Stack Hub and Edge are ruggedized. These are essentially bringing, again, that portable hyperscale cloud computing capabilities um, straight to where you'd need it. And then Azure Stack Edge Mini R is seven pounds. It's about the size of a college textbook, and it can fit in a backpack. So again, the point of all of these and the point of the existing build out and increasing build out that Microsoft has provided specifically for our government customers is that these are giving you the ability to process and use these cloud technologies at the edge and utilize that data where you need it and when you need it versus having to either wait or use money, resources, bandwidth on storing that data. I'll pause here, do you have questions? Okay, good. If you want more information too, I believe tomorrow morning we've got um, another session that's gonna talk a little bit about private, um, sorry, hybrid and edge computing as well. All right, so let's talk a couple of use cases. Um, one of these would be predictive maintenance. So I know we've got Army customers, Air Force customers in the room today, and one big piece of um, both Army aviation that we're working with and Air Force as well is how can we kind of disrupt the current model of data management with the aerospace and defense industry, um, but instead stop relying on localized databases, localized aircraft management systems, and eating up that manpower, cost, time, storage, all of that. So by integrating the cloud model and the hyperscale cloud with AI and ML models, the DOD aviation can now have a rich consolidated framework um, to enable these new solutions. So for example, and this is a, an ongoing project, but for example, real-time analytics, right? So such as swap data, fleet management, monitoring, data off-link, things like that. We wanna make sure that we are saving 
manpower, we're saving time both in real scenarios and uh, fighting scenarios versus also testing scenarios as well. Another piece here is um, the supply management and uh, depot modernization piece that we're working across several different commands as well. So how can we make sure that we are tracking, we are taking correct inventory, we are you know, using part recognition and tagging and to just essentially save on those man hours and uh, modernize in that way. A couple of other are field operations and then ISR as well. We'll talk a little bit about cognitive services. So cognitive services are available in Azure, AWS, and Google has a great cognitive services platform as well. But what this essentially allows you to do is kind of use translation, transcription, object recognition, video indexing, things like that to make um, field ops and intelligent ops more useful and a lot more um, productive essentially. So this is also a great use case for edge devices like we talked about a little bit earlier, but how can we utilize these AI, ML, cognitive services models at the edge where you need it and then also not have to wait for bandwidth cycles or data migration or things like that to, to pump that back to your on-prem or cloud environment. Okay, I'll pause there with any questions. Gotcha. So how does this all work together, right? We talked a little bit about networking. We talked about on-prem versus hybrid versus multi-cloud scenario. Um, kind of how do we combine data from multiple edge devices across networking and into storage, AI and ML, Kubernetes, IaaS and PaaS, wherever that remote location will be. So this is like a light architecture of what that kind of looks like and how we are able to securely um, protect and provide that within your remote location or the edge device specifically. Okay. Sorry, I'm gonna roll through a couple of things. We talked about cognitive services, right? So these are available today in Gov, Secret, up the stack for the use of, we're using this a lot in the intelligence community and then a lot in DOD as well. So essentially this gives you vision, language, speech, and custom machine learning. Um, that allows you to not only make use of that at the edge, but also post-processing as well. So a lot of post-processing scenarios um, are equally as important as real time. Okay, and then real quick too, we have partnered with GitHub because we talked about um, sandboxes and developers and how do we make sure that our developers have appropriate dev test environments to, to build out where they need and to, to have that secure um, architecture requirements as well with that, and GitHub is an option. So that kind of shocks a lot of people. They're like, oh, can you really use GitHub with Azure? The answer is yes, and it's, a, it's an awesome solution. Okay, so let's talk about security here. I know this is a, an increasing concern and um, definitely something that we are consistently working on building out across all of the hybrid cloud models, right? So kind of to outline what our security investments look like, this goes back with the economies of scale model that we talked about earlier, but we have invested over a billion dollars in security um, investment, and then also we have a constant team of security experts that are consistently monitoring over the entire infrastructure. So we wanna make sure, of course, we're not only monitoring, but also building in um, threat detection, of course, across hybrid and cloud environments. A couple of built-in security controls that you'll run into. So um, within the Azure government enclave and then also in other cloud providers too, there are a lot of these built-in native tools. A lot of them um, don't cost you anything to take advantage of, but that's what our job is here is to make sure that you're building these out um, as useful as possible and making sure that you can take advantage of, of the security there. So one of these is identity and access. Today, honestly, I don't have a statistic on this, but I, you know, a lot of the security breaches and security threats that we're seeing today are coming from bad actors and also you know, internal bad actors as well. So that is a huge piece. How can we manage your identity? How can we make sure only the right people have the right access to the right things? But also in reverse to that, I know in, in a lot of government scenarios, we see people who are frustrated with you know, not having access to certain things because of compliance requirements or 
not being able to dev and test where you need to because of certain identity and access. So security goes hand in hand with not only securing your data and securing your cloud environments, but also being able to consistently build out and make those better without jumping through a ton of hoops. Um, network security too, that's a big one. You know, yes, we want to make sure that things that are available to the public internet, for example, or things that are going on external networks are secured before they come in and out of your environment. But on the other hand too, within your internal networking environment, it's increasingly important to have firewalls and existing um, DDoS protection and things like that within your internal network. Couple of security kind of offerings here, and um, I believe these slides, by the way, are going to be. I know you guys are all taking extreme notes, but these slides are going to be available if they're not already um, through the AFSIA portal. So when we talk about security, you know, we talk about zero trust and defense in depth. So this is a busy slide that we got going on, but this is kind of what we mean by a layered approach. How do we make sure that we have multiple layers of protection and attacks against one layer are isolated from subsequent layer attacks? So kind of to walk through this, you'll see on the left, there are a lot of different conditions and controls that you can use within the cloud to protect your assets at scale. So for example, you know, you have a ton of employee and um, contractor, for example, users that need access to your environments. You've got many, many trusted and compliant devices, and then increasingly in today's world too, a BYOD scenario, right? Bring your own device, adds more and more devices, not to mention um, IoT devices. You know, it's just an absolute sea of devices that, that you've got out there connected to your environment, honestly. Um, another condition would be physical and virtual location. So where are you located in terms of your security enclave, but also where are you physically in the world? And then the, all of the client apps and authentication methods that you have connected to those applications. So with all of this being said, here are the controls. You know, how can we kind of build out a web of what is the best way to secure these conditions matched with these controls and then manage your entire environment? So it's like an unlimited kind of scenarios of how can we use geolocation to also protect via um, allow or block or limited user access or MFA or things like that. So a lot of this you're probably using today already. I know that. Um, Hack authentication is a hot topic, and uh, for good reason. So, you know, MFA you run across a lot as well, and um, we are here to help y'all build out and make sure that you're using not only your hyperscale cloud to secure across the board, but also a lot of our great cloud security um, partners as well. So you've got a lot of options here, many controls um, that you can kind of walk through and roll out across the environment at enterprise scale. You can also roll out a lot of controls just at the application scale as well. So for example, you likely have many applications that need more or less security than others, and that's totally fine, or different applications that are in different locations around the globe, for example, um, and you know a lot of different combinations um, that you can combine there. Okay, so speaking of enterprise um, security management, so you know we're as we're going across these different kind of aspects of building out cloud models, you know, having different cloud providers, whether it's Google, AWS, Oracle, Azure, whatever it may be, how can we make sure that we're not only securing the specific cloud, so not just securing Azure specifically, but how can we secure both your on-prem environment? all the way to other cloud providers as well. So Azure Sentinel is a huge player today. It is the first cloud native SIEM on the market. And you know we recognize that protecting your assets, protecting your resources are not just protecting what you have in Azure existing. But with that, what Azure Sentinel allows you to do is connect everything that you see over here on the left, both your users, endpoints, applications, documents, email, all of that good stuff that y'all have running around your environment constantly 
How do we secure that and monitor that across your multi-cloud environment, also across partner solutions, IoT, VMs, things like that? So this is a really cool feature that we absolutely encourage you to take advantage of. Um, a big piece of this, too, is you know, not only with data that you need and computing that you need at the edge, but also within your secure environment is monitoring. You know, how do we have monitoring and analytics of your existing cloud environment so that we can see what's going on, who is changing what, who has access to what, and then how we can take steps to further secure that. So a cool feature here too that we've got is that it gives you alerts and security recommendations. So you can actually go into Azure Sentinel and into the Azure portal and make sure that you can click on specific steps to take to further secure your environment. And that is 100% recommended. So same thing with um, AWS. They also have a security hub that is, uh, allows you to secure your direct AWS environment. Um, and you know, like I said earlier, across whatever cloud provider you may have, take advantage of the architects and the resources that are available to help you build out these consistent, consistent um, security methodologies and architectures. Okay, so now we're gonna hop into kind of specific DOD cloud architectures, right? So how can we make sure that we are following the DOD SCCA secure cloud computing architecture um, and making sure that we're having a compliant solution that has the BCAP, VDSS, VDMS, all of those good requirements. So if you are not familiar with the SCCA requirements that DISA has put out, these are essentially um, DOD requirements and DISA requirements that have set out um, enterprise level security and management regulations. So um, it's a lot of you know, nice um, acronyms here, everything from SCCA to CAP, VDMS, VDSS, TCCM. And what this allows you to do essentially is DO, the DISA has set up this environment and requirements that make sure that your cloud computing environments are remaining secure. On the Azure side, we've built out an, a SACA, which is secure Azure computing architecture that is deployable uh, very easily in minutes essentially, and you can make sure that your entire environment is secured at that level. So to kind of walk y'all through what these requirements are, these go everything from CAP, like we talked about earlier, uh, which provides that access to the DOD networks and um, cloud access, and then also streamlines those workloads at the network boundary, also further providing another layer of security there. VDMS is Virtual Data Center Managed Services. Essentially what this piece here is, it's about the application host security um, and then privileged user access as well. So how can you make sure that we're securing commercial environments with the DISA requirements as well? This is not, you know, not the most exciting topic, but it's uh, something that I'm sure all of you are running across when, when you're building out in the cloud and building out uh, requirements there. So this is kind of what it looks like in terms of how we pair DISA requirements with Azure and how you can meet in whatever your cloud hosting may be. Um, each of the requirements kind of serve a different function, and then there are also cloud services that match up to each of those functions too. So what we've done specifically at Azure and AWS has something similar as well, is we've built out this pre-baked architecture that's in a repeatable method, and it's also, you can just pull the code off of GitHub. It's actually pretty neat. You can deploy this architecture specifically um, to your environment, and what that's called is a mission landing zone. So these are government-specific landing zones that allow you to build and deploy mission applications while meeting those DISA requirements. So you do kind of how this works is in your cloud environment, you'll need this in order to be compliant in IL-4, 5, and above, right? But once you have that subscription essentially built out with your mission landing zone requirements and with your SCCA requirements, um, then you can essentially use that subscription to build off on other subscriptions. So you know it's not a, not a case or a um, burden essentially to have to deploy a mission landing zone to each workload you do. Rather, it's kind of a level set baseline 
um, kind of layer of protecting your entire environment. These are also easily deployable. Here's a quick reference architecture um, kind of showing you how the DISA BCAP works in connection with the express route, right? We talked about that a bit earlier. And then also hitting your um, VPN gateway within your Azure environment as well. Cool. Okay, let's talk a little bit about cloud governance methodologies. Any questions on landing zones and building out secured um, aisle four and beyond environments? Awesome. Okay, so you know when we're building out governance and when we're building out what it's gonna look like in your environment, one piece of that governance is of course the mission landing zone like we just talked about, but another piece are policies, locks, and role-based access control. So locks are a great um, kind of resource and so are policies in terms of how do we make sure that whoever's developing, whether it's um, you know your developers or contractors or things like that within your environment, how do they have access to what they need at that time? So policies are great because they can allow you to enforce those rules over your either entire environment or also specific subscriptions or applications. Um, and then a cool piece here too, <coughs> Oops, sorry, it's almost like I've been talking for an hour and a half. But a cool piece here are blueprints. So what blueprints allow you to do are roll out across either, again, your environment, your applications, or specific workloads, entire rules and regulations that just make sure that we've got those specific safety and compliance and security regulations in place. So one cool thing about blueprints is I'm sure you're all familiar with the NIST protocols and the NIST requirements that you need in your cloud environment. Blueprints automatically are built into the Azure government um, portal to allow you to click and deploy these blueprints essentially across your entire environment or wherever you may need this. So NIST is a good example of that. Those are in the Azure portal natively to make sure that we're following those and also that any developer that may be developing in there um, is also following those in terms of new build out. You can also kind of build your own policies and things like that across your environment. Okay, so let's talk real quick about cost management as well, and then we'll have um, some time for additional questions if needed. So, cost management here, and we've got a cost management solution both in Azure and AWS. Um, essentially what this is, is you know it's a big, big focus for especially our government customers to make sure that we are not only wasting, <laughs> that we're not wasting money in the cloud environments, right, but also making sure that we are right-sizing our investments, we are using predictive cost planning to make sure that we are both meeting budgets and planning accordingly for future budgets, um, and then also how do we make sure that we're putting, using our existing cloud investments and putting those to great use in our existing cloud environments. So. With that, you have a lot of baked into these, these cloud environments, you've got cost management solutions. So for example, in the Azure portal, you've got your cost management dashboard and it's similar in the AWS portal and the Google portals as well. Uh, but it shows you reporting, it shows you budgets and alerting and monitoring, but it also gives you recommendations. So it'll say things like, hey, you know, the other day I logged into my Azure government portal and it said, hey, you haven't used this VM, you know, this month, let's consider downsizing or deleting. And it walks you through and it's click of a button and next thing you know that, that VM's gone. So um, it, there's a lot of cool features to take advantage of here. We also, again, big on partners. We, we definitely are um, big on making sure you can use what, you're, you, what you'd like to use in the Azure environment. So if you've got these partners who, such as CloudFit or um, Cloudera, who provide specific cost monitoring and management services, you can bring those to Azure as well. So this is really good to work with, again, your, your cloud teams on how we can architect that appropriately and how we can make sure that we're managing and monitoring those costs. It also makes it easy for things like budget setting too. It's, it makes it a lot easier and an easier lift to plan for future, future budgets. Online too, you can go to AWS's, it's pretty easy to use, and so is Azure's as well, in terms of pricing calculators. 
So you can play around in there and see approximately what it's gonna cost you. You can do this in the Azure government and AWS government um, regions as well, and this will show you a approximation both of what these resources cost, but also you can play around and see what it would be like to change certain resource sizes or things like that. These are publicly available, so I would recommend um, working with your teams and um, contacts to get final pricing, of course, um, because you may see a lot of benefits that come to you as a government customer, of course. Okay, so procurement. Um, for government customers, you have two main options. Um, one of those being enterprise, so you can sign an enterprise agreement that commits you to spending a negotiated amount, which is annually paid, or you could also go through a cloud solution provider as well. So these are kind of the two main options for government customers. Um, and then, of course, contracting. There are several contract vehicles you can use. This is not a comprehensive list. Um, and then you also have resellers that you go through to procure that cloud specifically. One more thing about costing, too, um, is that, you know, of course, this is a consumption model, so cloud models are not based off of um, licenses or subscriptions or things like that. These are based off of specific consumption. So you only are paying for what you use, of course, and it's a pay-as-you-go model, too. So if, for example, you originally allocate the money to pay for a certain Kubernetes cluster, but then decide you would like to go with a different one or go with a different um, approach to pass there, then that's totally an option and you are not um, in vendor lock there, essentially. And then two um, kind of really cool things that are happening today in um, the, the cloud and government world are the Air Force Cloud One and then Army ECMA as well. There are other commands and um, DOD entities doing similar things too, but these are two really cool um, procurement offices and agencies essentially to take advantage of. So uh, what this allows you to do is if you're an Air Force customer or an Army customer, you can go to these agencies and utilize their existing investments in both that mission landing zone like we talked about earlier and also just that secured architecture that allows you to essentially MIP or money and have a connection to your own Azure subscription or AWS subscription within these environments. So I would definitely encourage you to take advantage of these two um, agencies. And um, if you're, you are Air Force or Army, then these are, these are great resources to have. Okay, so with that, you know, I want to definitely encourage you to work with whatever cloud you're using to take advantage of scaling options. Um, we have architects and we have entire migration teams and things like that to help you in the cloud journey and to help specifically DOD and IC customers build out these architectures that we've talked about today, build out these, these benefits that you can take advantage of, and a lot of this is at no additional cost as well with a subscription. So let us know if you need more information on any of that, um, and we are, of course, happy to talk you through that. So with that, thank you all for, for joining me here for the past two hours, and um, I, I'm glad you all could get your two education credits as well. But if you want more information on Microsoft Azure, then come see us at booth 815 or just come say hey. Um, I'm going to stick around a little bit more too if you all have any questions or want to talk further. But really appreciate it, and great to meet you all. <laughs>